Alright everyone, so today's lecture is going to be over eye disorders and this is part two of our two-part series over the eye. So let's go ahead and see what we'll be covering today. Uh, last time we covered some of the more external structures and a few of the neural ophthalmologic conditions. Today we're going to be covering retinal stuff, traumatic, vascular, and then talking briefly about some vision abnormalities. As always, here are your learning objectives for you to follow along with. First off, we're going to cover retinal disorders, and the three retinal um, conditions that we're going to cover are macular degeneration, retinal detachment, and various forms of retinopathy. So let's start off with macular degeneration. So macular degeneration is also known as age-related macular degeneration. And so you can see it abbreviated as AMD, ARMD, or just called macular degeneration. Let me get my pen up. All right, so AMD, ARMD, or macular degeneration, but not MD. Um, so macular degeneration, as we, as we know, in the back of the, the eye, inside the eye, uh, we have the optic disc, which is where the nerves and vessels kind of enter the, the insert, internal surface of the eye. Then we have the macula, and the macula is the darker area that is responsible for central vision, visual acuity. So the sharp vision, the reading vision, the, the vision that we use to, to differentiate between things is that central vision and it's located along the macula, I think. Yeah, here we go. This is the macula right here. And that area has also a little area in the middle called the fovea, and that is the area that has uh, cones, a lot of cone-rich uh, areas. So there's the most rods and cones in this area. It's the area of the eye that allows us to read and, and see things more clearly, very fine uh, vision, okay? Uh, so macular degeneration affects the macula, it's degeneration of the macula. So hence, you would uh, come to think that you get um, spotty or blurred vision uh, in the central fields along the macula. And this is a very common disease of the elderly. So it's the most common cause of permanent legal blindness and visual loss in the elderly. That's considered greater than 75 years old. Um, not really 100% sure how macular degeneration works, but we know that some of the risk factors include, of course, number one, age. So the older you get, the higher risk you have of developing macular degeneration. Um, uh, those with a white ethnicity, smoking and alcohol are also um, risk factors. Uh, it can run in the family. For instance, my grandfather had macular degeneration uh, to the point where he was almost a little bit blind from it. And my mom actually has early macular degeneration. Um, other things like cardiovascular disease and then some secondary toxic effects can affect um, macular degeneration formation. But in most cases, when we hear vignettes, we hear older folks. So macular degeneration is a gradual, painless central vision loss. So as we've been going through these different eye conditions, you should be kind of creating a little inventory in your brain of which ones are gradual and which, which ones are sudden, which ones are painless and which ones are painful, which ones affect both eyes and which ones affect only one eye. And by the end of this lecture, you should have kind of a, a nice little chart formed within your brain, and I'll actually help you out and provide you a chart at the end of this lecture that helps you break down the different eye conditions and how they present, because that's really important when you're reading vignettes and also in real life. Um, so there are two types of macular degeneration. We have the dry macular degeneration and the wet. Now the dry is way more common. You see 85% of the cases are dry. And by dry, it means it's, it's not, it doesn't have a lot of hemorrhage involved. There's not a lot of leaking. Uh, basically what you get is atrophy, just like everywhere else in the body as we age. And you get breakdown of the macula, which is that, that dark, uh, dense area. Uh, within the retina. And you get this uh, deposits of these uh, these yellowish tinge deposits called drusen. And the way you can remember drusen is starts with a D, drusen, and D, dry. Now drusen actually means droplets, which 
remind me of what, but it's actually dry. Uh, it's a German word. And so this progression of the disease is gradual. Okay, so we get it over time. The patient starts having a little trouble of seeing. Sometimes it can be mistaken for uh, like presbyopia where we get kind of this change in vision over time and patients just kind of blow it off. Um, but you'll see these yellowish deposits. You see the yellow. And, you know, it's actually normal to get some drusen within the eye. So just because you have drusen doesn't mean that you have macular degeneration, but it should definitely be um, looked at more closely. Uh, then we have wet macular degeneration. Now, wet macular degeneration is not as common, and it's more advanced, um, kind of like the next step up from dry, and that is when you get these deposits along the macula, the body tries to start creating new vascular pathways to, uh, to supply that part of the eye. And these new blood vessels are weak, kind of uh, baby blood vessels that just are not are not good at at holding or, or maintaining their integrity. So they tend to leak. They leak fluid. They damage retinal cells, and you get this like wet appearance, lots of scarring and hemorrhaging within the retina. And these tend to once we get to this stage, tend to cause more more rapid and severe vision loss. And this one tends to once it starts getting wet, it starts. Um, t taking a faster course. Now this is probably the best diagram of the whole lecture. I left it in here because I thought it was kind of funny that I put it in there to begin with, but it shows this demonstration of a healthy eye and a eye with degenerated macula. And I don't know about y'all, but it looks almost exactly the same except for maybe that little dot is a little less pronounced, but uh, it didn't really help much. I just wanted to, to help reinforce that it is the macula that is degenerated, but it's in the name. So anyways, keep going. Uh, physical exam finding. So these patients, if you suspect macular degeneration or, or you just want to screen them, kind of look for macular degeneration, maybe they have a family history, uh, you need to have a dilated fundoscopic exam. Now, it, we have fundoscopes, right? We have them, um, or fundoscopes, ophthalmoscopes. We have them in our doctor's office, right, on the wall. Uh, we have them in our fancy medical kits. But how many of us actually use them? Well, I'd like to, to venture to, to guess that some maybe family practice do it with their diabetic patients and things. But to be honest, if we want to really assess the fundus, we're going to have to refer these patients to ophthalmology or optometry because they can dilate the, the eye and look with more sophisticated uh, equipment. Uh, they have uh, equipment that can kind of piece together um, with a computer, piece together the entire back of the retina so that it looks like this. Because when we look at it through the ophthalmoscope, we kind of see bits and pieces of it. So anyways, my point to this is, if you suspect it in your elderly patient, your family practice or somewhere, refer them so that they can have a dilated fundoscopic exam. They'll take photos, they'll take a look at the back, they can also use a, a tomography um, to look at the kind of landscape of the back of the eye. Uh, what we'll see, like we mentioned, is the drusen in the dry and the wet, the wet because it's bloody and leaky, so you'll see a lot of neovascularization and hemorrhage. <clears throat> now, the way patients describe their vision is again painless central vision loss, uh, bilateral usually, and and where the vision loss kind of meets their vision, they get distortion. Um, so they get wavy, wavy lines. I, I guess we saw that over there too. Now, it's called metamorphosia, metamorphopsia. Yeah, metamorphopsia. It's hard to pronounce sometimes. Um, so what we can do at home, if we suspect an older person might ha might be on the fringe of developing macular degeneration, is we can ask them to use an Amsler grid. And this is an Amsler grid. It looks like just a, you know, hash marks, uh, vertical and horizontal, with the central um, dot here. But they should look at, with each eye um, on a regular basis, and if they start developing this metamorphopsia here, this, this blurring or waviness of lines, that is indicator of macular degeneration. 
And my grandpa, who was uh, a physician, he was a psychiatrist for many years, he was family practice before that, he had an Amsler grid on his refrigerator. And I remember him religiously looking at it because he had, uh, by the end of his life, had pretty advanced macular degeneration. But anyways, I always asked him, like, what is that thing? Is it a game or, you know, crossword puzzle? <laughs> but no, it's an Amsler grid. So you should remember that because they like to test on Amsler grids. I'm not as concerned with treatment as far as primary care is concerned, but one thing that I should mention here are the the things that we can tell our patients that help. Uh, so antioxidants and vitamins, including zinc and smoking cessation are the top things you can do, modifications that you can suggest to your patient. Um, other preventative measures that I wanna discuss are protecting the eyes from the sun, my grandfather and my mom religiously wear uh, sunglasses. I mean, even if she's just walking from to get the mail, she wears sunglasses. That can protect the eyes and help delay the progression. Uh, healthy lifestyle habits, like with any disease, so diets, um, lots of antioxidants, zinc, vitamins. Um, also, be, being physically fit tends to help. I'm not sure how that's related, but being physically fit, active is, is good for the whole body. And then, of course, we want to decrease smoking. We want to uh, encourage smoking cessation because that can make it worse. Um, for the wet, there are some things like the uh, anti-VEGF -VEG inhibitors that we can do because we're getting a lot of neovascularization, so you can imagine uh, that's not a good thing. And so we give these um, intravitrally, so injected into the eye, to help uh, limit the, that neovascularization. There's also some photodynamic therapy. I don't expect you to really know a whole lot about this because, I mean, it's a little advanced. But still, zinc and anti antioxidant vitamins and all these other preventative measures, right? All right, so moving on, retinal detachment. I think a lot of us have probably heard of retinal detachment before. Maybe some of us have even had it before. Um, essentially, the retina is attached to the choroid, um, which is the vascular layer uh, underneath, and then beneath that you have the um, sclera, the, the layers of the eye. And the retinal detachment is what it says it is. It's when the retina detaches from that choroid layer. Um, and with the, when the retina detaches, of course, the retina is, is where all those rods and cones are located that help send those neural signals back to per, be perceived as vision. And so we lose vision um, because of it, and it can be sight impairing long term if we don't treat it, uh, identify it and treat it quickly. Um, so the most common cause, there are different causes of retinal detachment. The most common cause is uh, uh Reg regimetogenous detachment. <laughs> I can never pronounce that word. Uh, but essentially like tearing. Tearing. And it can come from trauma and several other things. Um, myopia, other things like that. Um, so what patients typically describe is this uh, onset, kind of quick onset of floaters, flashing lights, and uh, the flashing lights come from that, when this, the retina is separated, again, we have all those rods and cones in that, in that area and they're getting kind of firing incidentally because of the, set, the, the damage to that area. So you get kind of floaters and flashers. Um, you do need to do a dilated eye exam to be able to see a true retinal detachment. Um, the little uh, ophthalmoscope on the walls is probably not gonna cut it. Um, they're often spontaneous, but there's some things that kind of tend to, pres uh, to exist underlyingly. Uh, we have age of 50 and over, recent surgery, anytime you have scar formation within the back of the eye or you, you I guess, traumatize the eye a bit, the scarring tends to contract and you can get some, um, some retinal detachment. And then one that I really see a lot tested is this myopia. So the folks that are severely nearsighted, like myself, um, we are at a higher risk for developing retinal detachment. And I'm not exactly sure why that happens, but as we know with uh, persons that are uh, s significantly myopic, their eyes are abnormally shaped, usually elongated, and that can put some 
different kind of forces on the back of the eye. Uh, so retinal detachment again, peripheral vision loss, usually in the superior temporal area, so up kind of where the the lacrimal gland is, kind of you get this curtain closing appearance. It can be all of a sudden, and it's usually one eye, monocular, uh, painless, okay, so shouldn't uh, be painful. You get this curtain or dark cloud covering over the eye, usually in the superior temporal area, a shadow, you get floaters and flashers, and um, then afterwards have a defects within your vision. And physical exam, you're going to have decreased visual acuity, depending on how bad. If the retinal detachment doesn't make it all the way to the macula, you might still have preserved fine vision or visual acuity uh, and just have that peripheral issue. But if the, the retinal detachment uh, extends all the way past the macula, then we have a problem. Um, and this can be long-term sight impairment. Um, so we want a fundoscopy. We want to do it with dilation. We want to look for the, the folding, tearing, drooping of the, of, the, of the fundus of the retina. As you can see, a couple of different um, depictions. And... Don't feel bad if when you look at these, you don't exactly know what's going on. I mean, I don't expect y'all, I'm not going to give you like a slide deck of a fun, a fundoscopic uh, exams and have you tell me exactly what all these little lumps and bumps are, but have an idea of what normal looks like and comparing it to this, you can clearly see that there's abnormal abnormalities here. So we diagnose it again by direct visualization through fundoscopy. Um, we can see the crinkling of the retina changes sometimes in vessel direction if it crinkles past the vessel uh, you can also actually perform ultrasound so like in er's where we we have a lot of ultrasound you can actually perform ultrasound and you can kind of see that defect which is pretty cool um, this is kind of how a patient might see if they had retinal detachment um, and it, it's an ophthalmologic emergency so they should have immediate referral for ophthalmology. Um, in, the, in the interim, until they're seen, they should stay supine because we want that vitreous fluid or jelly-like substance to sit on the retina and keep it back against the back wall. So if we if turn the opposite direction, if we turn like this, then the retina can kind of free float and detach more. So until we get seen by the ophthalmology, stay supine if we can. And you want to turn the head towards the side of the detached retina to keep it in place. Um, there are several different treatments for retinal detachment. One is that seems to be kind of more commonly mentioned is this uh, pneumatic uh, retinoplexy. And that is when they actually inject a gas bubble within the, the posterior chamber. And what that does is it fills up the space and it puts pressure on the retina and kind of sticks it back to the back. Now, once they do put the uh, the air bubble in the back of the eye, the patient then has to remain in a prone position, so face down, for an extended period of time until that heals. It's usually, I believe, uh, several weeks, so it can be quite uncomfortable for the patient, um, but it is one of the better, more um, successful treatments that we have available. So as a quick recap, we do have three different types. I didn't really mention them as much, but uh, regimatogenous uh, is the number one type, and that's um, separation of the retina. Remember, this is from, it can be from a little bit of trauma, it can be from myopia, it can be from other things. Traction is usually with fibrosis from scarring and things. The, the traction or pulling of the scarring, you know, when scarring happen, it kind of shrinks down a bit that traction pulls the retina off and then there's serous and that's when uh, fluid builds up between the layers of the the retina and it starts detaching it that way all right moving on so next we're going to cover retinopathy now retinopathy is kind of a blanket term there are several different types of retinopathy that you should be familiar with the two ones that i see the most are going to be diabetic retinopathy and hypertensive retinopathy. However, there are other types of retinopathy to be familiar with, but strictly uh, on a 
more um, familiarity type. Diabetic is the one that you really need to know about the most. So in general, retinopathy the mo is becoming the most common cause of new permanent vision loss and or blindness in the 25 to 74 year old category. And we see it in the United States, it, especially diabetic retinopathy is, is moving on up. It is one of the more common reasons why patients um, develop blindness and, and vision impairment. Uh, again, most common diabetic retinopathy, especially here in the United States. What happens, I mean, we know what diabetes does. It damages the entire body uh, and the, the eye is not spared. So you get damage to the blood vessels with that hyperglycemia. It leads to uh, different areas of ischemia and edemia, edema, excuse me. And the excess sugar uh, causes capillary wall breakdown to so get a lot of leakiness within there. And then when those capillaries break down, the body thinks we need to create more new blood vessels, new vascularization. Um, and then in the late stages, you start developing a lot of new leaky vessels and it becomes kind of a mess. Um, so again, we have the two different stages. We have the early, which is the non-proliferative. It's before you start making the new neovascularization and then proliferative. That's the late, more advanced uh, vision impairing type. And that's when you start creating those new blood vessels. Like we mentioned before, there are other types of retinopathy. Hypertension is one. Uh, you also have some inflammatory infectious causes that you can see here, which we're not going to mention in detail. All right, so how do these present? Well, in most cases, and why can be so much damage can take place before we do anything about it is that, that in early cases, it is asymptomatic. So they don't really have much changes in their vision, uh, but there are visible changes within the retina that we should be um, screening for. And so uh, most common in diabetic patients, again, um, decreased visual acuity over time, especially is a gradual thing. And then fundoscopic changes, which we should start becoming familiar with a little bit. Some of the things that we tend to see in diabetic retinopathy are going to be uh, some little hemorrhages, dot blot hemorrhages, exudates, cotton wool spots, um, micro aneurysms, and um, Again, towards the end, you're going to see more hemorrhaging and neovascularization. Here's some good ones too. So you'll see the non-proliferative non -proliferative type. You see some little aneurysms, some exudates, cotton wool spots, hemorrhaging. Um, and again, there's the things that we just talked, dot blot hemorrhages and things. In the proliferative, like more severe, uh, you're going to see that plus a lot of leakiness and neovascularization because it looks a little more pr pr profound. How do we treat it? Well, if it is caused by diabetes, we need to control the blood sugar. Um, we need to make sure that, that the blood sugar stays within uh, the right means, and that, that's a teamwork thing between you and the patient. Also, blood pressure should remain normal, especially for hypertensive uh, retinopathy. Um, prevention. Pati diabetic patients should have yearly eye exams by an ophthalmologist. Uh, so you need to make sure as a primary care, if you are, uh, make sure that they are staying um, caught up with their checks. You know, they have other things. They have to check their feet and other things. So just make sure that they are, they are having their annual visual exam. Um, there are some treatments that can be done. There's some of that. Um, anti-EGF, anti-EGF stuff. There's um, some steroids, uh, vitreectomy, laser stuff. I don't expect you to know any of this. The most important stuff that we can do for our patients is prevention um, and a yearly dilated exam. I, I plan to do a little bit more practice on, on looking at the fundus and we'll do that in some of our cases, okay?
So moving on to the fun stuff, I think it is, at least as an ER-minded provider, traumatic disorders. So let's look at some of these, okay? First, we're going to start with blowout fracture. Now, I did mention this a little bit when we talked about anatomy and the anatomy of the head and the face, uh, but let's talk about it a little bit more. So blowout fractures, you get hit, you get punched, a ball hits you in the face, and that blunt force trauma sends an impact through the orbit. Now, the orbital rim is, is, created, is uh, created by a, a pretty sturdy bones, but the orbit itself is a very thin, fragile bone, especially the inferior wall. And so when you get that, that blow, that trauma, those forces send so much force that, that, that the weakest area, which is the floor of the orbit, bursts or blows out and you get a fracture in the, um, in the, the um, excuse me, the orbit and the orbital bones. And um, it, again, it blows out the weak orbital floor, okay? Um, what happens then when you get this blowout here, this little fracture, you can see this area is missing. You get gravity pulling down the contents of the orbit into the sinus. And so if you remember that you have a muscle, the, the inferior rectus muscle that sits right there on top of it. So that can get stuck within these broken fragments and you can get entrapment. You can also have paresthesias um, because of damage to the infraorbital nerve. So how do these patients present? Well, it's usually some sort of preceding trauma and you can get eyelid swelling, ecchymosis, and pain. Um, the trauma and the swelling might take a minute to set in. You might not have a completely swollen shut eye when they get to you, but it can happen over time. If the patient has entrapment, of the the muscle of the extraocular muscles you'll get double vision when you ask the patient to look up so that's what they're doing here this this eye is tracking up properly but this one's getting caught and so in at this point when the eyes are not looking um sy synchronously th then you'll get double vision um you can also have some anesthesia remember we mentioned from damage to the infraorbital nerve which exits uh around this area the cheek and then you can get end up almost like a sunk, sunken in eye because everything's kind of sinking into that fracture area. Uh, physical exam, swelling. So I won't rely 100% on swelling. You can see it's actually not that swollen in this case. I actually had a kid that came in one time uh, when I was working ER. He was uh, playing basketball in one of those little portable basketball rims and they had lowered it down so that they could do a dunking competition. And I'm guessing he was between eight and 10 years old and he dunked the ball on the basketball rim and the basketball rim fell and hit him uh, on the eye, hit him over here. So he had a big laceration over here and the eye was a little bit swollen, but it wasn't bad. You know, when I saw him, I got a CT because he did, you know, hit the face was a little swollen. And then I was waiting on the CT results. Well, I went back in and I sewed up his cut, got that working good. And by the time I come out of the room, the doc says, hey, who's this patient that, that you're seeing over here, this so-and-so? And I said, oh, well, I just finished sewing him up. And he said, well, he has an, uh, an orbital fracture. And I was like, what? You know, I mean, I did get the CT thinking there could be, but I didn't have a high suspicion. So I was kind of shocked. So anyways, anytime you have trauma to area, consider it. Um, you can get, you can actually get air because, because you get, um, a crack and it goes into the sinus, you know, sinus is connected to your nose. So if you blow, blow your nose, sneeze, cough, you actually push air up into the subcutaneous tissue and you can get this crepitus and emphysema. So it's air under the skin. Uh, it feels like kind of like Rice Krispies, kind of weird. And then, um, of course, restriction of the globe movement, double vision, and then you can have step-offs. And that's kind of what happens here. How do you diagnose it? Well, the history is going to help. The physical exam is going to help even more. And then CT is what you're going to want to get. Okay. Um, if you do have an orbital fracture, you do need to have an ophthalmic uh, referral. It uh, should be pretty prompt. Uh, sometimes plastic surgery are the the folks that see these patients um, because they have to reconstruct some of this orbit. It really just depends what facility you're working at and who's on call. 
Um, surgery might be necessary. Otherwise, uh, sometimes it's just monitoring. Um, the main thing is you give the patient instructions not to blow their nose and not to cough, sneeze. If they can help it, obviously can always help it, but that's what can cause air to travel up and get into the skin around here. It goes up, up through here and gets all in this area and it can look really, it can be very, dis very uncomfortable and look funky. Right. Next up on the trauma list, we have a corneal abrasion. Now, I see corneal abrasions regularly in the emergency department, and so you will too uh, if you choose to work there and on your rotations. So an abrasion, just like an abrasion anywhere else, is when you scrape the surface. And so it is one of the most common visits to the ED. You know what's kind of interesting is there are a lot of people that don't go to their doctor for anything, but you'll notice that it if someone hurts their eye or they're having trouble seeing, they go right away and they come to the ER. So we do tend to see a lot of uh, eye complaints in the emergency department, which is one of the reasons why I volunteered to do HENT. I just really like it. Um, it is also a prom, uh, problem you see a lot in urgent care. Most commonly, it's, com it's coming from some sort of, sort of accidental trauma. So accidentally poking someone in the eye, um, accidentally getting something that flies up and hits the eye, scratching it with like a makeup brush or uh, little babies. They get like, I don't know what it is about parents uh, being scared to cut their baby's nails. Have you ever seen baby's nails? They, they look like little raptor claws sometimes. And you know, what, what do babies do when they get sleepy? Well, they rub their eyes and so sometimes they can scratch their eye and they'll come in just fussy. And it, you'll have to kind of start investigating. I've actually seen that one time where a baby came in because they were fussy. The parents could not get them to just chill. And what had happened was that she had actually scratched her cornea and, and she was crying. She was fussy. So it was hard to tell that the eye was um, watery. Um, so anyways, we figured it out. Um, other things like mm, mowing the lawn, um, cutting metal, sanding, dusting, all that can happen. And I also want to see and look for foreign bodies like we see here that can kind of hang out and cause abrasions. If you can imagine when this lid is in a normal position, that little foreign body is scratching the eye every time it opens and shuts, every time it blink. Okay. So corneal abrasions are super painful. The patient's going to come in really uncomfortable and it's usually acute onset so within 24 hours usually within a few hours is when they present um, one of the good things and not so good things about corneal abrasion is they hurt and they they hurt really quickly after it happens but because the cornea is constantly turning over cells uh, it repairs itself rather quickly so usually within a couple days a day and a half to two days this pain is gone. So that's something that's positive to share with your patients. But pain, tearing, sometimes they have photophobia, they feel like something's stuck in their eye, a, a gritty feeling, blurred vision, headache. And you can also get some corneal abrasions related to wearing contacts. But in this case, you should also kind of look for an ulceration and an infection. Um, sometimes, depending on where the, the cut is, if it's on the visual field, it's in the area where you're seeing on the cornea, then you might have some decreased visual acuity. Um, you'll also want to do a fluorescein staining. That's the way that you diagnose it. That's this um, dye that we put in the eye. And if there is a scratch on the cornea, it lights up like a Christmas tree. Uh, also, don't forget to flip the upper lid because you're looking under the upper lid for any type of a foreign body that's stuck there that's, that's, that's scratching the eye. Um, and then about the, the baby with the long fingernails. Diagnosed with fluorescein staining. That's easy. It's pretty cool when you see it. It lights up. Okay. Uh, if they have a, a visible ulcer, it looks kind of more like a little crater like, like this. Uh, without needing the fluorescein or if they wear contacts, you got to have a higher suspicion that it might be something more than just an abrasion. Uh, so if there is a foreign body, we want to remove it or irrigate it. Usually foreign bodies, uh, depending on where they are or what they are, you can remove with either a, a wet cotton swab or a little 18 gauge needle. You can scrape them off. Um, I tend to prescribe, well, to do these procedures, they're very, very uncomfortable 
to begin with. So I usually use a tetracaine or a preparacaine drop within the eye to numb it before I start uh, putting the fluorescein in. And right away, if the patient feels better, you know that it's probably that. It's probably a, um, a corneal abrasion because you're numbing the surface of the eye. They feel better. Like, oh my gosh, it feels so much better. Uh, make sure that you do tell them that that will wear off and that you cannot prescribe or dispense that. You don't want to leave it in the room either because it'll end up in their pocket or their purse. Um, after you've diagnosed the corneal abrasion, we usually put the patient on a topical antibiotic ointment because it helps lubricate and also prevents any type of infection from forming. Uh, if it was a metallic foreign body or really any foreign body, it's a cut. So you'll want to make sure that they are up to date on their tetanus booster. And then back in the day, they used to recommend patching for corneal abrasions, but it's not so much recommended anymore. So if you see a question, patching is not the correct answer, okay? Um, and then they need to follow up with an eye specialist, especially if the abrasion is like here where you're seeing and it can um, impair your vision. So globe injuries. The, the eyes is a closed structure, right? It's a globe. It's like a really firm water balloon. has a different types of liquid within it, but it is a closed system. And so anytime we have um, a blunt or penetrating injury, it can cause significant and permanent damage to the eye. It is uh, an, a true emergency of the eye. And so any, ev if everything and anything that you do is going to be... Um, as soon as possible without delay and getting that ophthalmology on board um, and you want to you want to get them on board and you want to avoid manipulation or medication so essentially if you have an open globe it might not be this crazy it might just be a little puncture or something like like up here you you don't want to touch it you don't want to manipulate it you don't want to you know, poke on it, prod on it, and you don't want to put any type of medications on it because they can injure the eye and cause worse damage. So what we see here is a fluorescein staining. When we put the stain on, we see like a dripping of this of the fluorescein. And what that's significant, uh, it's called Seidel's test or Seidel's sign. And that is uh, fluid from inside the, the eye, which is leaking out of a, of a ruptured globe. And so it's normal for an abrasion to see a stagnant uh, fluorescein uptake, but if you see it running down like that, that is a sign that, that there is an open globe and it should be investigated further. So the first thing you do is inspect. You're going to look for edema, hematoma in and around. You're going to ask about the, the history. You're going to look for, uh, for lacerations, hematomas, foreign bodies, and then the pupil, if you have an open globe, tends to be irregular, irregularly shaped, teardrop shaped. Sometimes it can kind of prolapse. Uh, the eye can kind of look and feel less full. It's like a deflated balloon. Uh, you might not have the same amount of reaction or decreased movement with the extraocular muscles. And then the anterior chamber could possibly have a hyphema. Uh, which we can look for. And then if we look inside the eye, it might be really hard to see because you might get some ruptured vessels. And then, of course, with shaken baby syndrome, you might see those same vessels and, and retinal detachment, which we talked about in psych. Uh, you could palpate the rim, but you don't want to palpate the eye. Do not palpate the eye itself. So you will, you do want to document a, a visual acuity as with any eye issue. I always, always, always document a visual acuity. It should be done at baseline so that you can uh, establish where they are when they got there and see if there is change, uh, which indicates more serious trauma. Here's that teardrop uh, iris we talked about. And here's the open globe where that, the colored part of the eye is actually getting kind of vacuumed out. Um, you want to check reactions. If you have unequal reactions, that's severe trauma. Uh, you can check for intraocular pressure, but again, you do not want to measure it. You don't want to touch it unless the ophthalmologist tells you to do so. Do not check this. Um, you can inspect it though, but don't put anything in it unless you're instructed to by the ophthalmologist. Okay. If they have a penetrating trauma like this, you want to leave it there. Do not 
remove it. Don't apply pressure. If you have to transport a patient like this, say from your urgent care clinic to the ER, to the ophthalmology office, you'll want to put some sort of shield on it. Like uh, a good thing is like a cup, like a styrofoam cup. You'll cut it and kind of put it on the eye to protect it and tape it down. Uh, you just want to not touch it, want to not manipulate it. And they should get the emergency consult with the ophthalmologist. Uh, you can give some medication if needed, but not topically. And then one other thing that they do recommend is IV antibiotics because you do have an open globe injury. If we're talking, so n injuries aren't always penetrating. Sometimes you can have chemical burns on the eye, uh, like when liquids splash up into your face or into your eye. Now, in these cases, the eye, we should contact poison control for advisement. On, on what to do and they'll tell you exactly to the minute what you should do with your patient which is really convenient uh, but the first thing you should do is is um, numb the eye uh, with some preparacaine or tetracaine drops and you're going to irrigate the eye copiously copiously I'm talking about 30 minutes worth not just a quick like oh, I rinsed it and it should be like a normal saline bag uh, because the, the burn can continue burning even after you flush it because it's chemical. And so you you we use the Morgan lens, which was in your intro lecture. A Morgan lens, like a little contact lens with a little tube on it. And so you put this underneath the eyelid, so the eyelid's here, like that. And this runs to the IV pole with the bag of fluids, uh, runs in and irrigates the eye copiously. It's uncomfortable, but it needs to be done. And then once you're done with, with irrigating the eye like recommended, then you check the pH of the eye to see um, if we're back to normal, okay? Foreign bodies. So foreign bodies, we patients complain similar to a corneal abrasion, um, you should Look for the foreign body, uh, numb the eyeball, use some fluorescein, and look under the eyelids. If you see it, gently remove it. I usually start with a moistened cotton swab applicator first, but if it is like a little metallic foreign body within the cornea, it can kind of embed itself a little bit. And if that's the case, I usually use a large bore needle and just gently scrape. Um, and then if there is a rust ring, they, they must use a rotating burr, which we had one in our ER. It's just like a little oscillating burr that can take the rust ring off. But at the end of the day, you should refer to the ophthalmologist and update their tetanus vaccine. We also usually give them prophylactic antibiotic ointment to help prevent pre infection. Uh, let's see. So again, globe rupture, we kind of talked about it already. Um, we, it's an emergency. Immediate ophthalmology consultation, uh, plus or minus a CT scan, but not an ultrasound CT scan to look for any damage uh, deeper than the eye itself. Uh, don't touch it. Call ophthalmology. Um, again, don't avoid any examination that might apply pressure to the eyeball. That's, if they're going to ask you something about this on the test, it's going to be to trick you. Don't check intraocular pressure. Uh, don't put eye drops in the eye. Uh, don't remove any protruding, protruding foreign bodies. Just begin IV antibiotics and um, keep put, a, put some sort of shield on it to protect it and get them to the ophthalmologist. So hyphema. Hyphema is a buildup of blood in the anterior chamber of the eye. Remember, the anterior chamber is nestled between the innermost cornea and the iris. And when we have trauma, uh, blood can accumulate in the anterior chamber and, and settle. You'll usually see kind of a half moon here of blood. And that is called a hyphema. It isn't an emergency. Um, and... Uh, mechanism can vary, can get blunt or penetrating trauma, things like paintballs, baseballs, hockey pucks, um, an elbow, and you get little tears in the ciliary body or the iris which bleed, and just make sure if there is trauma that everything else is okay, you check for orbital fractures, skull fractures, other things, 
And then we want to look at the eye. If we see a little hyphema, a lot of times patients will have pain, photophobia, some blurred vision because of the, the cells that can kind of block their vision. Sometimes they can even have a little bit of nausea or increase in intraocular pressure because it, the blood can kind of block the drainage from the anterior chamber of the eye since it's more viscous, similar to like a glaucoma, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, you might have some decreased visual acuity, which we always want to document. Um, injective sclera, conjunctiva, unequal pupils, and of course the blood in the anterior chamber, which is the telltale sign. Uh, it's clinical. You'll see it. Sometimes we might get an orbital CT if you think there's a globe injury or a orbital orbital bone injury, and you need to get them to an ophthalmologist. Until you get them to the ophthalmologist, what you're responsible for is um, examining the eye, doing a more comprehensive eye examination, checking intra intraocular pressures. Um, we want to keep the eye shielded if we can elevate that the head of the bed to about 30 45 degrees to try to keep this in the anterior chamber and keep it from going back and into the eye itself um, you can also give a uh, topical glucocorticoid eye drops and monitor them uh, we do not want to give enzymes though because they can thin the blood more and cause more bleeding and we leave it up to the ophthalmologist whether or not surgery is indicated. So that was the traumatic stuff. It might be a good idea right now to go ahead and take a quick break. We are a little more than halfway through. And when you come back, we will tackle the last little bit of this lecture. All right, coming back, we have vascular disorders. So let's see. Within the eye, um, the eye itself and the inner structures of the eye uh, are supplied by vessels that come in through the optic nerve area. And the major vessel is the ophthalmic artery, is a branch off of the internal carotid. It's actually the first branch. So we see internal carotid coming up and into the skull, and then we see the ophthalmic artery coming off first. So you can imagine that if I were to have some sort of uh, emboli or embolus that breaks off of, say, the carotid, common carotid area, you know how we get those plaques that build up in the neck, it breaks off and it goes, it's either going to go to the brain and cause a stroke, or it might get lucky, I guess, if you can call it lucky, maybe, I guess so, it might go to your eye instead and you can get what's called a central retinal artery occlusion, okay? Central retinal artery occlusion is an occlusion of the central retinal artery. Uh, it can be the whole artery or it can be parts of the branches of it. And it's caused by an, most commonly by an embolus causing profound unilateral vision loss, painless unilateral vision loss. So we can, uh, I can't say the word. 
it's equivalent to an eye stroke, right? So this is the artery, central retinal artery occlusion is when a piece of material breaks off and blocks the central retinal artery, causing an eye stroke, okay? So you might be thinking, well, we covered something similar to this back in neuro, but we called it a TIA. So what's the difference? Well, a TIA is transient. It's in the name, right? Transient ischemic attack. So it's the same thing, right? You get blockage there and you get short-term um, vision changes, but those are fleeting, okay? The, the TIA should, should not last more than an hour. It should be minutes, okay? And it, it dissipates. If it lasts more than that, we have not a TIA. We have a central retinal artery occlusion, Okay, so they get sudden, profound, monocular, painless vision loss, most commonly due to an embolism, but it can also happen kind of more locally, where you get either vasculitis or a thrombus or things like that. Um, what we'll see, which we'll see on the next slides, is you'll see because there's lack of blood flow to the retina, the color will change. It'll look more pale. And you'll get actually a macular cherry red spot. Just like call it cherries. Uh, and the cherry red spot is because, here's some cherries. Cherry red spot is because the macula gets a little bit of its blood supply from a different source. And so it looks red in comparison to the pale retina around it. You'll also get, remember that Marcus Gunn people we talked about last time with optic neuritis? You can also get that with this because when that artery is occluded, uh, you're not getting any input to, from the optic nerve to the brain, and so it's not going to react to light the same way that a normal eye does. Treatment, well, consult ophthalmology. Don't you just love it? Most of these things are consult ophthalmology. And you also need to consult, consult neurology because these patients are at very, very high risk for a stroke. Um, and then there are some different treatments that can be used. There's some conservative measures that are pretty ineffective, like digital massage and uh, positioning, lowering intraocular pressure. Um, and then also there are some reports of an intraarterial TPA that's injected, uh, but we'll leave that to the specialist. Another thing I want to mention here is central retinal vein occlusion, which is its cousin. But instead of the artery being occluded, it's the vein. So it's kind of like an IDVT. And the differences between this is it can be variable. It can be less sudden and profound. It can be more insidious where you get kind of a blurred vision. Uh, it can be sudden, but sometimes it's not. It's usually even painless and monocular. And these are um, the same kind of risk factors that you have for stroke, hypercoagulable states. Even OCPs can um, contribute to this. And in this case, instead of lack of blood flow to the eye, it's lack of drainage of the blood flow from the eye. And so you're getting gorgement of the vessels and you get, because those vessels get big, they get leaky and they start bursting. So in the back of the eye, you notice this blood and thunder. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Again, neural ophthalmologic uh, consults, and there's really not much we can do for them. We just kind of have to watch them try to figure out, well, we try to figure out why they're hypercoagulable in most cases. All right, so we talked about it already, but we're going to talk about it real quick again. Central renal artery occlusion, acute visual loss, painless, monocular, and it is an ophthalmic emergency just like a stroke, okay? You can think of it as a stroke to the eye. Prognosis is poor. Even if you treat them immediately, it's not good. Um, again, we said emboli most common. Uh, you must differentiate it from giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis uh, because you can actually get some central retinal artery occlusion associated with giant cell arteritis and, and you treat it differently. So you want to know if this is what it is. If you're getting that jaw claudication and the tenderness around the area, you want to know because you treat it differently. Also, optic neuritis can present similarly, but optic neuritis is pretty painful. This one has pain whereas central retinal artery occlusion should be painless. Uh, it's more in the elderly, uh, so ages of 50 to 80. We're also looking for other comorbidities like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, cardiac arrhythmia like AFib, diabetes, atherosclerosis. Those are risk factors. 
Um, it can happen from ruptured plaque. It can send a clot from AFib, endocarditis, valvular disease, hypercoagulable states, etc. So here's that cherry red spot. So here's the macula, which looks red in comparison to this pale spot around. So this is the cherry red spot. Okay. Um, it, like we said, sudden, painless, unilateral. Uh, but it's going to last more than the amaurosis fuga. Uh, it's not going to be fleeting. Okay. Um, let's see. The way you diagnosis, well, history, and then looking at the, fund the fundus, seeing that cherry red spot, um, being careful to consider, consider temporal arteritis and stroke. Okay. Uh, other than the pallor of the retina, you can get some, some arteriolar narrowing, you can get some box carring where you get like areas that don't have flow. Um, it looks like little box cars cause there's like blood in only parts of the vessel. You can get the Marcus gun people, edema, um, and then ganglionic death leading to uh, blindness because it's, it's essentially becoming ischemic and not getting um, blood supply. Uh, in reference to temporal arteritis, temporal arteritis has a visual loss in about a fourth of the cases. So about 25% of patients have some sort of visual defect. So that's why it's really important to differentiate these two. It's an opto emergency. Uh, things you want to do as a primary person um, is try to reduce the intraocular pressure. You can give uh, hypotensive drugs like timolol, acetazolamide, IV. Uh, keep the patient in a recumbent position. Lots and lots of O2. Okay. Uh, they say you can kind of massage the eye, although it doesn't really very effective according to the studies I read. Um, and we want to get the patient on board. There's actually in specialized centers of selective uh, use of injectable thrombolytic like TPA in the eye that you can use. Um, and then, of course, in, around, and after the fact, you want to figure out why they're atherosclerotic. You want to do uh, carotid dopplers and, and EKG and things to look for AFib or plaques that could be the culprit. For central retinal vein occlusion, uh, usually more thrombotic than embolic. Um, the same kind of um, risk factors, including hyperviscous states like polycythemia, leukemia, uh, taking oral contraceptives. For some reason, this is more common, like when people are waking up in the morning is when it first starts. Also, smoking and oral contraceptives are contributing factors. This is what is called that blood and thunder. It looks like something straight out of Game of Thrones, like the song of blood and thunder. That's what it reminds me of. Um, it looks bad. And that is because the veins are so engorged that they're starting to leak and burst all over the place. Okay. It can be sudden, but sometimes more gradual, unilateral, painless, blurred vision, or complete vision loss. Uh, sometimes these patients, along with central artery uh, patients, can have no vision or even sometimes just see fingers. They can only differentiate fingers. They can't read a Snellen chart. Um, same afferent pupillary defect, the Marcus Gunn pupil. Uh, you might see some swelling of the optic disc and the blood and thunder appearance. Treatment, well, it is an optical emergency. There's not a whole lot that can be done. The main thing is you can do some VEGF inhibitors, but the main thing is uh, you want to look for the cause. All right, so we just talked about this. Let's talk about amaurosis. Amaurosis fuga. Amaurosis meaning dark, fuga meaning fleeting. So it's a fleeting darkness. Fleeting is the key here. So it is transient, like a TIA, transient or complete loss of vision in one eye, partial or complete. And the most common cause is an emboli from carotid artery plaques. This is like the stroke that gets the eye and not the, not the brain, uh, but it is transient, okay? And you'll get, depending on where the blockage takes place, you'll either get a complete loss of vision or you'll get a scotoma just an area of dark vision and these patients typically describe this as a curtain coming down over one's eye similar to the uh, retinal detachment uh, but obviously different 
And if the clot, if and when the clot passes, the vision loss is transient, so it comes back. If it cannot pass, it's the CRAO, and we proceed that down that path. So we've talked about this already in neuro, right? Uh, you can see some of the same things that you see in central retinal artery occlusion, uh, some of that pallor, cherry red macula, um, and it, but it does re should resolve on its own, or that it's not that. If it does not resolve spontaneously within one hour of occlusion, it's considered a CRAL. All right. So a couple of vision issues. Okay, this is called amblyopia. So amblyopia is called a lazy eye, not to be confused with strabismus, which is a crossed eye. And those two, for some reason, I have a little trouble differentiating them. I'm going to try to help you the way that I was taught, help you differentiate between the two. So amblyopia is not really a problem of the eye itself. It's a problem of the eye-brain connection. So the nerve pathways between the brain and the eye are not working and so essentially so let's say let's just say my right eye is bad i was born with a cataract or i was born with some sort of abnormality to that eye it doesn't see well well the brain is receiving signal from my right and my left eye my right eye sucks my left eye is okay but eventually the brain's going to say you know what this right eye i keep trying to process this crappy information it's giving me and it's not making any sense, but this left eye is doing a great job. So you know what? Why am I doing double work here? I'm going to go ahead and just shut you off. I'm going to cut you off right eye. And left eye, I'm going to take all my visual input from you. And so the brain uh, starts shutting off the pathway. So this is the right eye. This is the left eye. This is the good one. This is the bad one. The brain just says, uh-uh, I'm done with you, right eye. We're going to take all our visual input from here. And so then this eye kind of falls to the wayside. It, it just, it doesn't send input anymore. And so it, it comes from not properly stimulating the brain. And so the brain favors the good eye. And it often occurs in early childhood with um, issues related to the eye. It can be caused most commonly by strabismus, which is that cross-eyed. So you can imagine... If this eye is crossed, right, and this eye is normal, uh, this they're going to be receiving different input, kind of almost like a double vision, right, because they're not aligned. And this one's giving the wrong thing because I'm looking with this eye, I'm tracking back and forth, and my brain is following this eye. This eye is not, it's really just doing what it wants. So eventually, the brain's going to shut this eye off. That is amblyopia, secondary to strabismus, okay? Other things that can cause it, any reason why the eye doesn't work, um, polybomas, where you get multiple irises, uh, you can have cataracts, you can have um, toxins and other things that can cause it as well. Um, so one of the eyes eventually just doesn't work like the other one. It's not a cross-eyed, uh, but it doesn't work and the brain turns it off. Both eyes can be affected, but it's usually just one. So with the eye that's affected, you'll have a decreased visual acuity, so you won't be able to see as well, and you'll have an abnormal vision screening. Um, you'll want to look at the eyes. You'll want to have the patient track your finger, looking for tracking and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then depending on if there's a asymmetry of the eyes, you'll see a defect in the red reflex. Um, that's why we look. So we look at babies we look at their eyes every time we see them we see them a lot um, every few months as a baby and then moving on into uh, adulthood or sorry into toddlerhood you'll see them uh, vision screenings at three four or five years old we want to catch these deficits before they cause amblyopia because amblyopia can be prevented so the treatment how we treat amblyopia or how do we prevent it is by patching the good eye so if we force the brain to use the eye that's not working as well, then we keep stimulating those neural pathways that are forming at a rapid rate for young kids. Um, my little nephew has multiple irises. He has two. They're oddly shaped. And he 
since he was a baby, has had to wear glasses. One of those little babies had to wear glasses and patch. Well, he hates it. It is really, really hard to keep a baby and a toddler in glasses and a patch. And so for those children that cannot tolerate it, there is some uh, drops and things you can do to blur that, that eye's vision so that the brain is forced to use the, the bad eye. Um, you should be treated as early as possible because as you grow older, one, the brain's already starting to shut off the, the bad eye, and two, the, those, the brain is growing at such a fast rate when kids are little. Um, so you, you miss out on that window to create those neural pathways. All right, so moving on, let's talk about glaucoma. Uh, now, glaucoma is an emergency. Well, let's take it back. There's different types of glaucoma. Glaucoma means increased intraocular pressure. So within the eye, there's fluid within the anterior chamber up here, fluid that fills this area. There's also vitreous humor back here. And there's um, a normal pressures that exist within the eye. Uh, because this fluid has to be kind of circulated, there is a circulation that takes place where the fluid comes up and in the iris and then flows back through these little, this little strainer system here and is recycled. So we have fresh fluid in the aqueous humor. So that sieve or mesh work is, is called trabecular mesh work. And that's where the aqueous humor passes through the canal of Schlem. And that's normal circulation. Now, Sometimes, for different reasons, there is a blockage or a failure of that aqueous humor to pass through those uh, areas. And so you get buildup of the fluid and it increases the pressure within the eye. So you get an increased intraocular pressure. Um, uh, greater than 21 is considered elevated ocular pressure. Now, there are two major, sub, two major types of glaucoma, we have acute and chronic, and we also have angle closure glaucoma and open angle glaucoma. And we're gonna talk about those in specific. So acute angle closure glaucoma is a true ophthalmologic emergency. And this happens when the iris dilates a little bit, it's gonna push on it, and it's gonna essentially block the angle. The angle is this angle right here, this is the angle right here, this little angle gets narrowed. And so it blocks the flow of, of fluid and you have an acute increase in pressure. And that posterior chamber pushes the, the iris forward, blocks the angle, and the intraocular pressure is ele acutely elevated. Now these patients have acute, severe unilateral eye pain and decreased visual acuity. And it tends, they tend to kind of see it, especially in vignettes, like when a patient goes from a, lightly, a brightly lit room to a darkly lit room, the, the iris um, dilates and that kind of cr creates or instigates this acute angle closure glaucoma. Also headache, nausea, vomiting, tearing. And so on physical exam, there's a classic triad. We get injective conjunctiva, which is pretty nonspecific. Um, we get a cloudy or steamy cornea, not a lens like cataracts, but a cornea. And we get a fixed mid-dilated pupil, okay? Fixed mean it doesn't react anymore. It doesn't react. It stays there. Mid-dilated pupil. Painful. Patients are, come in horrible pain, sometimes headache, nausea. They're throwing up. Uh, and you want to diagnose it by tonometry. So you get your tonometry pen and you check the intraocular pressure. Anything greater than a 21 is considered positive, although the numbers that we see in this are usually a lot higher. Uh, you'll also see cupping of the optic nerve if you're good at looking at a fundus. I'm not that great at it, I won't lie, but you do have a cupped disc ratio that is increased. Open angle glaucoma, which is different, also has impaired aqueous fluid, but it's not because of the closing of the angle, it's just not passing through. And it's usually more gradual. Um, and it's essentially just a block strainer, okay? Uh, it's more of a slow process. And it is, in fact, the most common type, uh, up to 90% of cases in the United States. 
tend to see it more in African American population. And that is why when these patients go to get screened, they, they are screened for this because you don't always know that you have it, it takes a while. Usually get some visual loss peripheral to central, okay? Whereas in macular degeneration, you get central to peripheral. Uh, usually they're asymptomatic early, uh, but then towards the end, they get peripheral vision loss. Uh, increased cup to disc ratios, as I mentioned before, and increased intraocular pressure. Uh, you diagnose by tonometry and fundoscopy. So screening. All patients should be screened at the age of 40 for uh, open angle glaucoma. So you're going to look, you're going to send them to the specialist so they can look for an increased cup to disc ratio. So the cup to disc ratio, I don't know if I have a picture of it, but the optic disc, you have a cup and a disc and it, the ratio between the two has to be uh, less than less than half. Okay. <clears throat> if you, if you notice a normal cup to disc ratio, then you also perform a tonometry. And last but not least, if you're still thinking it, you do a, a peripheral field testing, looking for peripheral vision changes. So acute angle closure glaucoma, remember this one was emergency, right? Emergency. This one, you're going to give um, medications to decrease the pressure. IV acetazolamide is a first-line agent uh, to decrease the aqueous humor production. Uh, you give other things like topical beta blockers, uh, myotics, um, and then... There is the peripheral uh, irid iridotomy. That's when they put the hole, but that's for ophthalmology. Okay. Um, for chronic open angle glaucoma, we give uh, prostaglandin analogs uh, like latanoprost. There are um, drops that we give. And also um, uh, topical beta blockers. And then if the, these medications don't work, you can do um, trabeculoplasty where you kind of open up the, the mesh work. All right, I think this is one of the last things that we have. There's maybe two more topics to cover. Scleritis recovering really briefly. So sclera is the white part of the eye. Remember, all the vessels kind of sit on top of the sclera. And so scleritis is uh, inflammation of the sclera and the episcler episcleritis is of the episclera and sclera. Um, it's inflammation, and it's usually associated with a immunologic disease, like rheumatoid arthritis. So this is not pink eye. This is worse. So they cause significant eye pain, and it's like a deep pain. It's not the superficial, un un it's uncomfortable kind of thing. They usually get severe painful eye, constant headache, watering, and severe redness, okay? Um... You, it hurts just to touch the eye, and they can also even get some visual impairment. So here's some of the things that can cause it. Um, the, a lot of things I see in questions are RA, a, a, ankylosing spondylitis, Rider's syndrome. Um, how do you diagnose it? Well, it's a clinical diagnosis, so you're going to do you know immunologic testing, rheumatologic testing um, for for diseases and refer for ophthalmology and rheumatology usually or immunologist um, treatment topical and systemic corticosteroids are the, the mainstay of treatment for this and of course you want to treat the underlying condition um, there is also episcleritis and scleritis and uh, depending on um, if you put some epinephrine drops in the eye, episcleritis should blanch, scleritis should not. I've seen that on exams before. Last but not least, we have strabismus. We already mentioned this when we talked about amblyopia, but strabismus is, is just misalignment of the two eyes or, or of the one eye to the other. So any type of misalignment is strabismus. They also call it kind of like a crossed eye, but they don't always have to cross. Sometimes they can be outward deviating. Um, what, what happens is the two eyes are, are relying to, on each other to stay together to send input to the brain. And when one doesn't, uh, it tends to deviate to one side or the other. Um, then it, is, it can be a problem because the brain's not receiving adequate input. Um, there's different kinds. There's exotropia, esotropia, and there's others as well. There's just a couple to mention. Uh, it can lead to a lazy eye. Uh, we, what we do is um, 
a corneal light reflex to look for the reflection. I mean, you can tell without using the light reflex that the, the reflex is on different parts of the eye. Uh, they also do a cover-uncover test to see if the eye corrects itself once you uncover it. Remember, you cover the good eye, the bad eye corrects itself so you're forced to look through it. Um, treatment, it's the same as, as what prevents amblyopia, so glasses and patching and things of the good eye. Um, sometimes if there's anatomic deformities that are the cause of it, there, there has to be surgery that takes place. There are also some exercises and you know therapy and things that can help. Um, if left treated, you can develop that amblyopia. Remember, treating early is the key. So my last two slides are your eye cheat sheet. We've covered everything that there is, almost everything, uh, about the eye. We did not cover uh, retinoblastoma, which we'll cover in neoplasms. But otherwise, we've covered everything. So now it's up to you to start putting those pieces of information, those nuggets of info that you're getting in a vignette, put those together and determine what is wrong with your patient. You're going to want to know, is it an emergent condition or not? Is it happening more in older people or young? Is it more central or peripheral vision loss? Is there pain or no? Is it acute onset or gradual onset? And is it one eye or both eyes? So this chart helps a lot with putting all those pieces together. There's two. So we have uh, all of these and all of these. I think if you can learn this really, really well, you'll have a great handle on, uh, on the eye. Okay. I'm not saying this is all you need to know, but I'm saying if you do know this, if you learn this, commit to memory, it'll make your life a lot easier when it comes to differentiating uh, processes on exam. With that, we are done um, with the eye. Uh, ENT is really short, so we got to cram a lot of information into a really short period of time. I hope we got the eye down pretty well. If you have any questions or something still not making sense, feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, I will see you in class.